there has been, since at least the 17th century, when the great scientific societies, like the Royal Society, were founded, a division in the world of knowledge between the natural world and the sciences concerned with the natural world and those concerned with the cultural world, the things that humans make. That division is manifest in any university between the natural sciences departments and the humanities departments, with the social sciences being somewhere in between. Here at Imperial College, this is entirely an institution devoted to the sciences and engineering, and we have another one around the corner, the Royal College of Art and Design, which is completely unrelated to us. So, so the, the split is completely radical. But I think that's wrong. I think that the world of culture and the world of nature should be studied by the same people and it should be studied scientifically. I believe that there should be a new science of culture. And I want to outline what it would look like. So I'm an evolutionary biologist and for that reason, it won't surprise you when I say that I think that this new science of culture should be an evolutionary science. The reasons are really straightforward because culture shares something in common with organisms, which is what biology is concerned with, that, that they don't share with other things in the world. The first thing is that they are diverse. So if you go out into a forest or into a coral reef, the thing that strikes you and the thing that biologists love, especially evolutionary biologists, that motivates them is that immense diversity, that sense of variety within unity, of all the different varieties of fish and or corals and seashells and so on and so forth. And that is the thing that thrills us and, 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 and that we seek to explain, that diversity. And of course, there's one other thing that is one of the kind of phenomenon or class of objects that is diverse, and that is namely culture. And you don't have to look very far at it. You just have to look at the books behind me. All these are cultural objects. These, every one is the product of some person or several people. And collectively, well, I've got a few thousand books here, but I mean, this is only a tiny fraction of the number of books that have ever been written. Or music, for example. Uh, you know, a few a few years ago, I would have said, well, you know, you, we have, you know, uh, maybe a few hundred CDs or maybe ten thousand songs on our on our iPods, you know. But now, of course, we've all got access to thirty million songs via Spotify or iTunes, right? And then there's the scientific literature itself, all the millions upon millions upon millions and millions of papers. All that is culture. All of it is immensely diverse. And there's another thing which culture has in common with organismal diversity is that it is is that it is purposeful it has it you can ask the question what is it for you can't ask the question what is the moon or the stars for only a child would answer the, the answer is that they're, they're just there they, they, they don't do anything they don't have a purpose they just exist but that is not true of culture and it is not true of organisms and then there's the third thing that they have in common namely that they are both the consequence of a modification with descent process, to use Darwin's term. When a species evolves, it never evolves out of nothing. It evolves from another species. When a child is born, it doesn't appear de novo. It has parents. And it is, it is that transmission of information, genomic information, from one generation to the next, one species to the next via DNA, an imperfect process which allows for mutation and recombination that gives us this variety. And the same is true for culture. When we make a cultural object, when I write a book, a scientific paper, when you design a jet engine, when you make a film, you never start from scratch. You are always borrowing other people's ideas and concepts, hopefully not too closely, but borrow you do. And you take them and you mix them up and you produce something new. So that too is a process of descent with modification and that gives us all the diversity in the world. So that is why I believe there should be a science of culture but, and, and that it should be an evolutionary science. So what is the essence of doing such a science? How do we go about doing it? 
The answer is very straightforward. We quantify. The thing that has changed that makes the science possible today is that for the first time in history, practically all of the cultural products of all of humanity are available to us. When I grew up, as I said, we only had access to a few songs, but now we have access to 30 million. And, and, and books, all the books that have been published, we can get them on our iPads. And here's the thing, now that that's true, we can no longer afford to study them as traditional humanities scholars have done one at a time, reading them carefully, comparing this book with this book, that painting, that great painting with this great painting, and so constru constructing these restricted narratives based of, on the progress of one great work to another, one great artist, artist to another. What we now have to do, because we can, is study it all. And the only way to study it all is to read it automatically. Because humans can't do it, we have to get computers to do it. And that is what is happening. So there are people now, including myself, who are working on methods to read uh, art and, 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 and text and music automatically. This is the world of machine learning and to reduce all that immense diversity, cultural diversity, down to numbers. And once you reduce it to numbers, then you can begin to look for statistical patterns. And if you do that, then you can begin to model it mathematically. And if you do that, then you've made a science. And you have taken culture away from the humanities where they've had it for so long, and you've brought it into this new world of science. Sometimes I think that scientists armed with these new tools are going to overtake the humanities. But in my more charitable moments, I think, no, they're going to be our new partners. They know the stuff, they understand what it means. But we have the machines, we have the numbers, we have the tools. And I think we are going to see together a flourishing of our understanding of human culture over the next few years. So the essence of the problem is that we need to learn how to read all these cultural artifact, artifacts automatically. And the only way to do that is computationally. And there are various ways of doing it. So one way is to teach computers how to recognize particular objects. You train them. Right? This is machine learning. It's the sort of technology which is being used in facial recognition and in self-driving cars and all this sort of thing. But I'm not interested in getting a car to drive by itself. What I want is to make a computer recognize a tulip. And the reason I wanted to recognize a tulip is because I happen to be very interested in Isnik tiles. These are tiles made by Ottoman artists in these 16th and 15th century and they're very beautiful and they're covered with tulips and carnations and sas leaves and many other wonderful motifs some of which they got from China some of which they got from Iran and there are thousands of them if you go to Istanbul the mosques are just covered with these things and and scholars have studied them to be sure but they've only studied a fraction of them what I want to do is I want to read them all take photographs of them all put them into a computer and get that computer to recognize and tell me what's on those things. And if I can do so, it can count them all. Now, we're doing that. But of course, that's just one project. That's tiles. That's the evolution of ornament. But you can do it to anything. I have a database of some 200,000 Dutch paintings, which is essentially the history of Dutch painting. Well, the Dutch have done it, right? And I've got their data, their pictures. And now I know how to recognize what's in those pictures so I can tell the story of the evolution of landscapes, or tulips again, because it just so happens that the Dutch love tulips too, or whatever. Those are, those are the kinds of techniques which you can now do, which, as it were, amplify the ability of mere humans to absorb all this immense diversity of stuff that we've made and that fills our world.